everyone. Welcome back to Musings this Monday. My name is Elizabeth Mannequin, and I am joined by my colleague and co-host, Allison portnell Lathrop, and several distinguished guests who I will introduce in a moment. Um, for those of you who are new to the segment, Musings is a deck of cards that contains a range of quotes from artists, activists, museum educators, and critics. Uh, some of them are silly, some of them are serious, some of them are somewhere in between. Um, but they're all meant to jumpstart critical conversations about the nature of art and museums, how they speak to us as individuals, and how they shape and reflect our society. Um, and as of this recording, uh, the world is ablaze in protest around the murder of George Floyd, Ahmaud Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, and countless other Black citizens at the hands of police and citizens. Um, and while this violence is not new, um, we know it is at the top of our minds, and I imagine it is on the top of many of your minds. And while these musing cards are often pulled at random, we selected today's musing um, by the acclaimed artist and philosopher Adrian Piper to catalyze a discussion with today's guests about their work and the worlds that they create um, through it. Allison? So before I get started with reading the question, I wanted to introduce our guests. Today we have Jason Woodbury, Marcus Kaiser, and Quentin Talley. Um, our three guests are all part of the Intergalactic Soul Artist Collaborative. Jason and Marcus are visual artists based in Charlotte, and Quentin is a musical artist, a musician based in Durham, um, who performs with Quentin Talley and the Soul Providers. And um, I'd love for us to consider this. We have a quote um, and then some things to ponder about it. So I'll go ahead and read our question um, while we all start to think about it. It's a quote from Adrienne Piper from Art as Catalysis from 1970. And she says, one reason for making and exhibiting a work is to induce a reaction or change in the viewer. So how, if at all, does that ring true in your own work? What works of art in the Ackland collection or elsewhere induce a reaction or change in you? So uh, Jason, would you like to start us off? Uh, sure. Um, so, uh, and, and, and Marcus can follow up. Ho hopefully I we'll probably end up repeating ourselves for the most part, but, uh, yeah, intergalactic. So when we when we create art, uh, we create art based on our convictions and uh, what it is we feel strongly about. Um, as black men, and I'm, I'm sure Q, Q feels the same. Um, there's almost a obligation to utilize your talents, to utilize your platform. Whenever you have the opportunity to say something, make sure that you say something. You know. Um, and I think that's that's what one of the things that intergalactic soul um, and everything that we create, there's always this very, very um, premeditated, um, there's a very premeditated idea and purpose behind everything that we create, everything that we do. Even, you know, the earlier works were intergalactic soul, we will always incorporate, um, we will have a line from a hip hop record. And that record was always uh even those lines and those lyrics were always harping on that same idea everything comes back to this point of how do we create this discussion um um what is it that we would like to say to the to the viewer and give them the opportunity to open the floor to, for them to respond and for them to digest it and as well as you know um for those who don't know, some people think like, you know, hip hop is all about like, you know, game banging and stuff like that. But the hip hop is a very expansive form of music with subcultures within it. Um, so that's that's one of the things that we always attempt to do. Um, it's not a matter of like shocking people or like this awe by putting something grotesque. That That's that's not really the goal. Um, again, at the end of the day, if, if, if the person at least asks themselves a question, or if they go home and they have a conversation about it, or even in that space, if they just have a conversation with someone they don't know or someone that isn't necessarily within their circle, they don't know whether they agree with them or not, it's a mission accomplished. 
because the right thing in that whether they agree with us or not, it at least they ask themselves the question. And um, and I think that's the start of, of any type of real type of pro progression, um, any type of um, to attack any type of biasness or any type of prejudices. And he has first ask our questions like, what is, what is the source of this? Where does this come from? Um, is this something like, who, where was I taught this? Where where along the line this road did this become the way that I thought about these people or this gender or whatever it may be? Um, so that, that's what we try to attack with Intergalactic Soul. Um, and, and as far as the artwork, um, I, and it's such an easy grab, but I go to Kerry James Marshall had a series he did called Rhythm Master. And, um, and this was actually after creating Intergalactic. So we were at the McCall residency and a friend of mine named Lauren who runs the uh, Locust Projects uh, Gallery in uh, Miami, Florida, she had mentioned to me about Carrie James Marshall uh, run called Rhythm Master, which was a comic book series he created. And he created it because he, he it, it was it was very parallel to the way that me and Marcus, the same discussions me and Marcus had, where we're like, yeah, you know, when I was growing up, it was X-Men and, you know, it was Superman. And it was like, man, all these fascinating superheroes, but like none of them were black, you know, like all, I, I'll, I, I say like for the most part growing up, a lot of my heroes, like fan, fictional heroes were white men. And um, Kerry James Marshall thought the same thing. And, but he also said he realized that there was a large demographic of black people who were in love with science fiction, who love comic books, so he created this series called Rhythm Master, and the characters within the, in the series were based on um, the Yoruba tribe. Um, I believe it was like seven gods. Um, I haven't read the whole series because I, I wasn't able to make it to the exhibition. So I, I kind of go on Google and try to find pages and stuff here and there. But that was, uh, his reason for doing it was one thing, but the way that he did it, the aesthetics of it, when he drew the characters, the characters were like a, when I say black, I mean, they were like absolute black. Mm -hmm. And the highlights that they had were shimmer. It almost looked like like a black pearl. Everybody's skin was very smooth. Um, they had these really bright highlights. It's all black and white. Um, I mean, his illustrations, just it's no color for the most part. But seeing how he did that and how dark he painted these characters with intention of doing so, um, it, it took me back. Yeah, I was, I was like blown away by it. Um, and yeah, yeah. So I, 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 if I were to say anything, that would, that's the series, that's the artwork of the pieces that you know I reflect on, and uh, hope that, well, hopefully one day I get to shake his hand for it. Yeah, that would be amazing. I saw his work in Chicago, and I was just blown away. To the the one that gets me is the with the paint by number pal and the palette. Oh. Yeah. Love that painting. <laughs> um, so Marcus, uh, what about for you? Is there a work of art that you think about um, inciting change or can you tell us more about the, the work that you do and how you think of it when you're creating? Um, yeah, to piggyback off Jason, yeah. Um, Carrie James Marshall was definitely, um, you know, one of the people that, that I kind of aspire to be like, but also, um, so I come from this world of like graphic design and working in marketing departments. And um, and also as we were in the McCall, like it's crazy because me and Jason kind of just, we're just doing this stuff with, um, you know, like I found out about Carrie James Marshall late, like Jason said, we were already like three exhibitions in after finding out. So I feel bad about like not having that knowledge until later. But um, also one of my favorites is, um, is uh, Emory Douglas, who is a graphic designer for the Black Panther Party. And, um, and you know, like I really have been looking at a bunch of his stuff. And, you know, we were talking about, I think I was in some meeting and we we're talking, we we're just joking about um, a TED talk. And, you know, and I was talking about possibly doing a TEDx talk. And they were talking about my talk being revolving around using graphic design as a means for social change. And um, I think a lot of our work has these heavy illustration elements as a part of it, as well as graphic design elements. And they almost play more like 
um, propaganda posters for like these safe spaces, spaces for blackness through this like Afrofuturist lens. And, um, and I look back at a lot of the stuff that Emory Douglas was doing uh, back in the 60s, uh, the free lunch program posters. And these things were like pretty much like used for like educational use for communities and to gather the people together. But then they somehow turned into these, these works of art. And, um, and we were actually going to do a um, residency down in Cuba at one point based off of like how our work kind of came off as like these propaganda style posters that kind of spread this message about like these issues that were going on and um, instead of like you know just a standard piece of art you know that evokes feelings like these were pretty much like you know these even though they were fictional um they're still telling a message about like what's going on in the world today and when we we're in the mccall center it was during the uh, Charlotte uprising back, this was 2015. So they were like literally the protests going on around the Keith Lamont Scott shooting. And um, I remember uh, there's an artist there, Glexus, um, who's based out of Miami as well. I remember him looking at some of the stuff in our studio and he was like, you know, you get print these over and over and just, flash these on like phone poles around any city in the world and they would read as like these propaganda messages you know that promote like you know like positivity and like in the about like these black spaces so i think um you know like we always talk about the visual artist aspect of stuff but like a lot of my like people that i you know because i'm always in marketing you know my job is always to like how do you get people to buy a product and I have to create imagery around that stuff around visual communication and I think a lot of the times you know like a lot of like the work in intergalactic soul there's a strong graphic design element to it so I think about those guys like um like Emory Douglas you know um one of you know like there's Emory Douglas and then you have like uh, your Octavia Butler's you know your science fiction writers um like Jason mentioned, and then you have like your even like your your pop artists like uh, Shepard Fairey and like those guys who are like taking like these graphical elements and doing stuff. But I would have to say like um, lately I've really been, and you know, I, I, as I get older and grow, because it used to be a lot of my heroes were like Frank Miller and like these comic book guys and and Todd McFarlane. But I think now right now um, I'm really big on like the stuff that Emory Douglas was doing and how he was like using these graphical elements to kind of like organize and uh, get the people together. That's great. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to pipe in that it's interesting. I've taught from um, Project LAX multiple times and I think all of those aspects of just a thinking of Carrie James Marshall and he's using black as sort of right out of the tube to be like we don't see enough black people in the museum so I'm gonna put not bright black like he's gonna and when people yes. talk about that um your installation when they first see it they see it as a mural but then when they engage with the augmented reality they really see it as this vast space and the black the meaning of the blackness in there like really does pivot and this idea of graphics and access and all of these multiple um ways of communicating that you've both been talking about i've seen time and time again that work create change in the students who see it so i i just wanted to make sure you knew that that students are getting all of those different um, modes of communication through that work whether it's the visual through the augmented reality and that the way that that changes but um and if you don't mind um uh, like what marcus was saying uh regarding glexus glexus is, we, we still keep in communication with glexus he's a phenomenal artist um and he was actually a, a cuban refugee and um and he when he came into our studio and he he talked about the pieces and you know, he was, you know, because originally he was on canvas, you know, all of our pieces on canvas. And he asked a question. He was like, why is your stuff on canvas? And we were like, that's what the museum's like, I guess. But he was like, you know, when when things were made for, for the people, for the audience, it was put on paper because that was accessible. 
you know, and he was like, you know, you, you want to make your work accessible. He was like, you know, even having it on paper is a sign of like accessibility. That was what they were used when they needed to put out protest posters, when they needed to get information across. And the canvases were always seen as being something that was associated with a more elitist society. And like, you know, I haven't put anything on canvas since then, needless to say, but it was, but it was, you know, it, it was, it was awesome being in that space, having a conversation with him. And he was telling us about the Afro-Cubans who there's a large population of Black Panthers who migrated to Cuba and then live there now. And a lot of the work that they created, even in the protests of uh, Vito Castro, had those kind of elements as, as Marcus, uh, as Marcus was, was saying. Um, but yeah, you know, and, and that's the thing. There's, there's, there's artists that we come across um, who are not as famous as the Carrie James Marshall. Um, there was another guy by the name of Mark Greenfield who we shared the residency with in the call who was, he was form, a former LA, he worked for the LAPD. He was a sketch artist for the LAPD and um, his morals were challenged and he ended up quitting and became a full-time artist. Um, and his art, and he actually did color art for Hanna-Barbera. So his work tends to take on a lot of the uh, things that challenge his uh, moral being when he was working for the LAPD and as well as some of like the cartoon aesthetics. So even looking at the things that, you know, that they do um, and seeing how they work, cause it's one thing to see the piece, but sometimes seeing how like another artist works and how they go through their process and how they convey their convictions, you know, they transfer their convictions onto paper or onto this canvas, or whatever it may be. That is a, a very, very inspiring thing to watch as well. Mm -hmm. Thinking it, we're talking so much about medium, like canvas versus paper, marketing materials versus, you know, intended for a museum wall. I, I want to think too about the non-graphic side of things with Quentin. Um, how do you think about music conveying um, the possibility of conveying meaning, uh, whether it's activist um, intentions? What, how does it work with your, with your work? So music for me uh, <clears throat> and throughout history, uh, especially uh, black history and American history has always been a catalyst for change. Um, you know, in the vein of Nina Simone, uh, you know, it's the artist's duty to talk about what's going on at the time. Um, so she's one of my favorite artists. Uh, you know, James Brown did the same thing. He kept it funky, but he also said, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. Um, you got Gil Scott Heron. So th those, those uh, folks really kind of paved the way for us. Um, and I say us youngins, I'm not a youngin anymore, but, <laughs> but um, you know, folks like that, the last poets, I come from the poetry world, um, consider myself a poet first and foremost. Um, as a writer. Um, so for, for me, music, music and change and make, trying to make the world a better place and, you know, see different perspectives. Uh, you know, music has always done that, done that for the world. Mm -hmm. And yeah. with, I know, well, you're just saying like uh, with music, there's, you know, there's the lyrics there's the textual element and there's the sonic, you know, the instrumental element too. Is that, yeah. do you think about that? I guess if you're from the poetry side of things, maybe are you thinking about the words first? How does that come up when you're collaborating with Marcus and Jason, um, thinking about the bigger universe of intergalactic soul? Yeah, that's why it's taking me so long to, <laughs> to get the music together because they keep producing pieces and I'm like, well, I can write a song about that, <laughs> but I'm trying to stay in the story. So, um, you know, it, it, you know it's, a, it's actually a back and forth thing. You know, they create pieces sometimes and then, you know, we work on the music. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a give and take, a good collabor collaboration between everyone, yeah. But usually the, the artwork comes first and then I think about, you know, all the things going on um, and how we can tie it in to the story. Hmm. That's really interesting. Do you all, yeah. Jason and Marcus, do you all think of like the narrative of the story first or do you think do you have imagery in your mind when you're thinking of like Astro and Pluto, your, um, 
your two black astronauts characters that um, navigate this universe? Like, how do you conceive of that? Um, oh, you want to go? No, you go. Yeah. Oh, well, I was going to say, um, so when I'm thinking about creating the pieces and because um, uh, I kind of try to look at it as a, well, at first, I'm going to be honest, like when I, the first couple pieces I did, I kind of didn't have a story in mind. I was just kind of just making these random pieces about Pluto and just kind of going off of the the rail. And I wanted it to kind of, I guess, looking at it as a trailer for like a movie and then looking at like the actual movie and kind of making sure that like trying to like tie all of the elements together. But um, yeah, I guess, um, and then, you know, like me and Jason have so many ideas about kind of like these, these mini stories and these side stories. And then we have like offset characters and things like that. But then I also have to keep in mind that there is like Q in the band that also has the like right to the narrative. So um, I kind of try not to limit myself. And like, I just, you know, like I think of, um, but there, yeah, we're always following the story. And then whenever like we're creating, because the Lax is a newer part of the show. And even with the project Lax, like we made sure that like Jason made sure that he had like the narrative for that already kind of laid out. So yeah, I think um, just kind of understanding that there there is like a narrative and just trying to make sure like, I have to keep in mind like, hey, we also have a band that probably would need to play to this as well. So yeah. Yeah. Um, similarly, this is a thing where usually I'll, like in my case, I'll just have an idea and I'll live with it for a bit. And before I even create it, um, I think to myself, like, how does this idea tie into what we've already done? You know, where does this fit in the narrative? And as Mark has mentioned, there's, there's so many sort of like sub narratives within it. Um, Marcus created a character called the last black starfighter, which like on his own could be a, just a total exhibition completely on his own, um, separate from Astro and Pluto. But that does tie in um, because the last black starfighter is a fictional character within intergalactic soul that uh, Astro and Pluto, um, you know, they, they watch this character on, on television and they're inspired by this character. This is kind of a person that they want to emulate, someone they want to become. Um, it's their hero, per se. So, um, yeah, so like even like the Project Lax thing, you know, it, it, like the idea came, you know, I had, I had been working on the text for probably like two years almost, um, but then it just came to the point, it was like, okay, like how does this work in the narrative where it doesn't, where it's not forced, like, you know, because, Cause then it, it just doesn't, you know, the, I, I, the audience is dumb. They're going to see it and like, yo, this doesn't, these two things don't correlate. It doesn't make sense. But um, it was a matter of figuring that, figuring that part out. But, but yeah, you know, we, we, if at the end of the day, there, there's a way <laughs> you just have to figure it out and tie it to the narrative. And that's challenging too. Um, but uh, you know, we, we get through it. We make it happen. It's, it's kind of amazing to hear sort of the evolution of the narrative and all the different ways it it sort of moves and evolves because watching people look at your work specifically with Project Blacks you can see the evolution of what's going on with this mural is it a mural is it a code it's enormous it's striking it's graphic and then they get the voice, they get the augmented reality and they evolve into that new space. They notice the side screen. So you can, you can see that whole evolution of the story and the universe unfolding in ways that not only does it change, I think then towards the end, right? They see history and future in, um, in dialogue with one another in new ways, but that perception changes as they're, watch as they're looking at it, which is um, mm -hmm. really incredible. Um, thank you all so much for your time today. 
thank you for creating the work that you do. I can say personally, it's been such a pleasure um, and a privilege to teach from. Um, if you, like me, could listen to more discussion, um, be sure to check out Intergalactic Solstice um, at Ackland.org. And if you have thoughts uh, or comments about the ways in which a work of art, either in the Ackland's collection or elsewhere, has changed you, um, please weigh in on our various social media channels. Thanks so much, and we'll see you.